It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Mary Jo Foley, too. It's not the end of the year quite. Oh, we're getting there. But Paul and Mary Jo are going to do their top five Microsoft stories. Mary Jo's will be the least covered of the most undercovered stories. Paul has the hottest stories as he sees it. We'll also talk about Windows 10 on Snapdragon. And uh, looking ahead to some interesting patents. It's all up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat and Mary Jo Foley, episode 548, recorded Wednesday, December 13th, 2017. Deck the Gong. Windows Weekly is brought to you by 23andMe.com. Now through December 26th, get up to $50 off each 23andMe DNA kit. Give the ultimate personalized gift by going to 23andMe.com slash twit. And by... Blue Apron, the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Check out this week's menu and get $30 off your first delivery with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash windows. And by Captera. Find software solutions for your business needs. Captera is a free website with over 500 categories of business software and thousands of ratings and reviews from software users just like you. Visit Capterra.com slash Windows today. It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. <laughs> we thought we might lose him in Hawaii, but no, he came back for some reason. From the it's cold uh, here. <laughs> yeah. From Thorat.com, T H U R R O T T dot com, uh, and uh, leanpub.com. And Mary Jo Foley is here from all about Microsoft.com. Together they represent the brain trust of this program. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. We're all in trouble, folks. Yep. yep <laughs> we yep. are. It's the brain trust <laughs> of Windows Weekly. <clears throat> and actually, since it is kind of our uh, last show, let me see. Well, we'll be back next week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Second How to last. Suddenly, literally, guest. at the end of the year. It just, just came crashing down on us. It's really fast, huh? Yeah. December, always, it's suddenly like, whoa, we're hey. at the end of the year. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, but I'm, next week, I'm Leo. hopeful, special guest, you know, at the end of the year, that usually means but one thing. He has agreed. He will ho, be back. Ho, ho. Chris Cap's annual grilling. <laughs> at the hands of the That's really Weekly becoming most. a tradition. This is the third year in a row. I love yeah. it. I love it. Yep. He said he loves it, so he he wanted to come well, back. We're very grateful. Sure he's wearing like a Santa hat or something. <laughs> Microsoft's CMO is that his title? Yeah, mm -hmm. Chief Marketing Officer for the whole company. Will join us next Wednesday. Wow, that's going to be exciting. Yeah. But this Wednesday. Yeah. We thought we would. <laughs> Next week will be great, but we're going to kind of tread gonna, water here. For yeah, it. this one's not going to be. No, no, this is going <laughs> to be good because. Like uh, you know, so so just actually a little calendaring. So next week, Chris Capicella, our last show of 2017. The week following, December 27th, of course, we're not going to. Nobody's going to be in studio that week, but we will have the best of. We've edited together some of the best moments. I'm sure a gong will be included, as perhaps <laughs> will be some feline friends. I think in certain Asian cultures, 2017 is referred to as the year of the gong. The year of the is gong really? cat. Guys, <laughs> you have be. to see the gong, though. It's it's ready for the holidays. Have you festivist the gong? Nice. Wow. The airing yeah. of grievances on that will be very fun. <sighs> yep. <laughs> Very fun. It's good. <laughs> She's got Holly on her gong. <laughs> <laughs> deck the gongs. Deck the gongs with baths of holly. With baths of holly. Fa -la 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 -la. It's like deck the doofus with the gong. <laughs> <laughs> that can happen too. Uh, actually, uh, this is kind of fun. You guys decided that you wanted to do the big stories of 2017 this week. And I think no better time to do that. So yes. who who gets to start? I think ladies first, Mary Jo Foley. Okay. So I I typically do a year end like look look back, but I feel like oh that's so boring and so predictable. So this year I tried Still something here. new. I tried to do five <laughs> Microsoft stories that f that kind of fell under the radar that I thought deserved a little more press than perhaps they've gotten. And number 1 for me on that list has to be the big Microsoft sales reorg of this year. I feel like it happened they laid off a few thousand people and then we just stopped talking about it. 
But that reorg they did was very far reaching and still is having a lot of repercussions for anybody who partners with Microsoft or buys from Microsoft. I keep hearing from people saying, yeah, they're still selling a lot of cloud and they're selling a lot of windows, but you know, it's really confusing how this is working now. And they're really changing how they're approaching the sale. And you know, now that Microsoft is measuring their sales staff based on how much you consume of their products and not just how much they sell into the channel. It's a whole new way that they're approaching sales. They're bringing a much more technical sales force to solve problems and they're actually getting in there and coding with customers. So I feel like we kind of just said, hey, big layoff and that was it. But this I think has a lot of repercussions for enterprise and even for consumer too. Hmm. So that was my number one pick. Sales staff Should we go back and usually forth? not the thing yeah, one would think so. of, right? Like, yeah, how <laughs> how does that help anybody? <laughs> but uh, no, I think it's very, the, when you do it that way, I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah, why, yeah. yeah. Why don't we go back and forth? So, Paul, yeah. your pick. Yeah. So my my picks are not in in order, but one of our yeah. picks overlaps. So I'm going to wait it's on my number one pick, so to speak, okay. until you do yours because they kind of they don't kind of they relate, and I think that's okay. kind of interesting. Um. Thematically, it's funny, Mary Jo said, you know, these are kind of some of the stories that fell under the radar that she picked. And I, of course, was scrambling to find some kind of theme to mine. And actually, there is a theme to mine, which is interesting because I didn't intend this. Um, both of these are kind of pro and con kind of things. They're not necessarily like big wins for Microsoft per se, but they are interesting um, on both ends of the spectrum uh, for Microsoft. So, for example, progressive web apps. I think people listen to this podcast. Are That's like huge. People I'm, I'm so excited yeah, about that. I mean, I'm, I'm so all on top of this topic. Yep. And I feel like, mm -hmm. in a way, things that fall under the radar it does fall into that category as well. Because, you know, Microsoft and Google especially have discussed progressive web apps throughout the year, typically at their developer-oriented uh, in-person or uh, virtual events. But I think the thing that's really interesting about this, and this is kind of the yin and the yang or the pro and the con, if you will, of uh, this thing for Microsoft – it's interesting to me that Microsoft's native app platform for Windows 10 has basically failed. And by basically, I mean, obviously, there, there are some decent uh, uh, universal apps. Um, but it seems like today the most successful things in the store are what I would call hybrid apps, like the Centennial apps that are really desktop apps that take on some UWP features. And I think going forward, progressive web apps are going to be the norm. They're going to be the mainstream app platform on <laughs> Windows. And, and that's good and bad because uh, Microsoft doesn't own this platform. It's open. Uh, these apps will run on other platforms, including Android and probably in the future iOS as well. Developers will be able to make um, Windows-specific or Windows-unique features available on that platform. We'll see who does, if anybody. Um, and I, I, But regardless, I, this is one of those things. Um, it, it didn't – I can't really claim that it happened in 2017, but it's happening in 2017. And I think by the time – we do this show again a year from now. The story here will be very different because with the next version of Windows 10 that's coming out in the spring, this will be officially implemented as an integrated uh, feature as part of Windows 10. And I think that's what's going to put it over the top on the desktop. It's, you know, what's also interesting is, uh, as you said, it's because it's cross-platform. I'm watching carefully what Apple does. They've hinted yeah. that they might put it in Safari. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, by the way, they did something interesting this week, which is, they uh, they started to become more strict on templated apps, which uh, is actually very controversial because it leaves out a lot of small businesses, pizza parlors, for instance, that use a pizza uh, yes. parlor so, creation app called Chow. How I actually was. think that this is a net negative for progressive web apps because it suggests that their mentality is that they don't want this kind of thing on their yeah, platform. Yeah, and that's no. very disappointing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if they do allow it, that gives you, uh, as a small business and opportunity right because then you know there's 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 something you can I, do I, I hope that they do i mean from a technical perspective there are many indications over the past versions of safari that they are in fact working to this end um, the people who at google who have sort of created this or have been nurturing it believe that apple is on board I but hope so i really do i do too i mean what they need is uh you know the ability to, to you know pin something to the 
homepage, which you know Safari has, right? For web pages, I mean, you could technically go to. They need service workers. That's the thing that's but they missing need, right, right they now. Need they need the, 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 the local, makes it an app. the yeah, local resources right. on an iPhone that will keep that app running even offline. And that's that's right. Until they put the bundle that into Safari, they're so locked down though. You have to be a little nervous about yeah. this. So yeah, and that we'll that see. could really put the kibosh on the whole thing, only because they are such a dominant player in mobile. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that would be very sad, and that would be very typical of that. Well, I mean, so. if if uh, <laughs> uh, progressive web apps only ran on Android and Windows, uh, that would still be eighty five percent of the market, the mm -hmm. addressable market, or whatever. Yeah. Yep. Well, we we will hope. We hope for more than that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, just saying, if it's not on, if it's not on iPhone, there's a lot of people who will say, well. Yep. You know, I don't. I don't well, want to okay, do a native but, app for the iPhone and then PWA for everybody else. Mm. It's. Arguably still better. Well, is it still better? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, Yeah, it's not much better than just making both of the mobile apps. Um, the thing is, the mobile app would still work on, I'm sorry, the uh, web app would still work on iOS. It's just that it wouldn't have those native app features like being offline. Right. Uh, which obviously is important. Be interesting to see. But I, I completely agree with you. In fact, I'd put that as the number one. Story. Yeah, these are in no particular Pen order. Pending, actually. of course. Like, pending, of course. Uh, it's it's a uh, wide adoptance and success. But Potential. Yeah. I wonder potential if it will make it into Redstone 4 for sure, yeah. too, because so far we've heard nothing. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, Donna Sakar hinted at a massive uh, Windows Insider build yeah. for this week if they can get it to happen. I don't know if you saw any updates today. I, I haven't been on Twitter yet. but uh, Yeah, um, I don't think she did any updates today, but yesterday they had a webcast where – she basically said they're trying to get a new build of Windows 10 out um, this Thursday. They're hoping they can. And then she said there's like a 25-page blog post about it. I hope that was right, a, right. an so exaggeration. It's going to have tons of new features. And I, yeah. The guys I talked to from Microsoft basically said that sometime in the near future we were going to see this appear uh, and that yeah. they would have specific sites we could use. And, and so we'll see. Uh, I'm, you know, cross your fingers and all that. Obviously, if the insider build doesn't happen this week, we're looking at January pretty much. Hmm. Or they could do it next week. I think last year they did one right before Christmas and they said, hey, here it is. Like, have yeah. fun. Okay. But right. not too fun if you work at Microsoft because then if <laughs> things go wrong, you're yeah, like, that's and, brave. you know, you're stuck there. <laughs> yeah, that's brave. That's them saying, yeah. we think we're going to make it perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mary Jo, your uh, your number two, number two. choice. Um, so I had to say something about growth mindset because we heard so much about that this year with you know, Satya Nadella's book, Hit Refresh. And my point about this is I feel, you know, how can you be against the things he's talking about? You know, you don't want to be a know-it-all. You want to be a learn-it-all, diversity, inclusion, all that stuff. But I almost feel like they've gone a little too extreme with this. And I think there still should be room for uh, people who don't agree with some of these Things And it shouldn't just be, hey, we're all empowering everyone to do more for the planet, blah, blah. And if you have any negative <laughs> blah, things blah, to say, blah. we don't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I feel, I feel like I, I called my second point. It's either growth mindset way or the highway. And I feel like <laughs> if you're not on board and you're like at Microsoft it. or you work with Microsoft, <laughs> they don't really want to hear from you about anything. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. yeah. I, so that was yeah, my number two. I agree two. with that. I, I, I've always seen this growth mindset thing as baloney, you know, and it's it's too early. Well, the book that they just published and he just spent the last three months going on a book tour and, and a tour of every cricket field on the planet, apparently. Um, you know, it's a little too soon to, to claim success on this stuff, you know. Um, and I disagree that some of the decisions he made were based on this principle. I think they were a lot of decisions are, you know, made just based on need at the time. So, whatever. All okay. right, your, uh, your turn, Paul. <laughs> so, I want to call out Xbox One X because uh, this is such an important milestone. And again, this is one of those pro-con kind of deals because literally within the past 24 hours, we discovered that Nintendo has sold 10 million units of the Switch console in nine months, which is exactly the same number of PlayStation 4s that Sony sold in its first nine months on the market. Sony recently announced that they had sold, I think the number was 70 million consoles to end users to consumers um and they are on track to outsell the previous generation console i don't remember the exact number but it was north of 80, 000, uh, 80 million um very quickly in a much faster time frame than was the case with the ps3 which means basically that 
when this console generation is all said and done, um, Microsoft, once again, is going to be in third place of three. And, uh, you know, that's the position it's always held. Um, it actually was winning the second generation for much of that time. And this PlayStation kind of swooped in at the end and pulled the Cincinnati Bengals on them. But the point is, um, <laughs> Microsoft is, <laughs> sorry, guys, uh, Microsoft <laughs> has had to look for other ways to um, make Xbox as a platform make sense. And the thing is, for all of the unit sales kind of defeats you can talk about, what they've done is not is incredible and is right and is right for consumers. And I've, and I've argued this over the past year, you know, when a lot of traditional gamers have complained that, oh, there are no Xbox exclusives if they run on Windows 2, that doesn't make any sense. And I think that Microsoft is working toward a future in which the console hardware disappears and they deliver gaming as a service. That didn't happen in 2017. But what happened in 2017 is that Microsoft delivered the first, what I would call the first real 4K console, and it's a monster, and it's awesome. And it's one of those things, you know, we've had our issues with Microsoft hardware over the years. Um, you kind of clench up a little bit, and you wait for all the terrible reports to come in about all the problems, and the truth is that hasn't happened. Um, and we'll see, you know, Christmas hasn't happened yet, the holidays have, hasn't happened, so maybe some of these things will be given as gifts, and we'll find out the, the truth of the matter. But so far, so good. And it's kind of astonishing to me that this thing is so powerful, so small, so quiet, right? So incredibly well made. It's just a uh, it's it's a nice win for Microsoft. It, it doesn't mean they're going to suddenly bounce back and beat PlayStation or anything like that. That's never going to happen, of course. But uh, you could have made a lot of great arguments about walking away from this market, or as I suggested in the past, selling off Xbox and letting it go as a, an independent company. And they didn't do that. And I, I, I think they were looking at a longer-term game maybe that I, than, say, I was, and that, like I said, the future of this is to those other metrics, you know, the number of users, the number of hours, the number of software titles purchased, the number of time spent on Xbox Live, the number of people who are on Xbox Live Gold, whatever, uh, is playing to Microsoft's strength, which, of course, is cloud services. And so we don't, you know, we don't see the end result of that today. What we see is a new console. But um, what a wonderful gift for the people who have stuck with the platform or maybe this Christmas will be new to the platform. I agree. I have to agree with you on the gaming thing. Like I, I, if you had asked me a year ago, is yeah. Microsoft possibly going to sell off Xbox that unit? Yep. I would have said yes. Mm -hmm. um, so this yeah. year, I think they made a definite. They took a they took a definite stand, and I, there, I think there's nobody who can say now Microsoft is not committed to gaming. They're right. all in on this, like bigger than I even thought they would be. And I think I, part of the reason too is because it's connected to what they're doing with AR and HoloLens, right? Um, and virtual mm -hmm. reality, mixed reality. Right. Uh, I think there's a direct connection between those two things and also between Minecraft and gaining the hearts and minds of the younger generation. So I think they just decided, you know what? The way to do this is gaming. And we can we can make a business out of gaming. Even if we don't make a lot on the consoles, we can yeah. make a lot on the services. I like it. It. I, I think if they're if they're successful and if they do what I believe they're going to do, what they'll do is take their gaming business away from a low margin, low volume hardware business to a high margin, high volume cloud business. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. reduce the costs and uh, amp up the um, the volume. I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they'll keep making better. consoles, right? I mean, or well, somebody I, actually, will make so them. I, right? I wonder if that doesn't, that's what I mean. Like, I, I think it might actually go away that they could do streaming a la, say, on live or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I playing to their strengths here makes tons of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Phil Spencer's ascension to part of the uh, Star Chamber over there at Microsoft is very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll see. Again, that didn't happen in 2017, but um, yeah. it's, it's, I sort of see it heading in that direction. Mm hmm. All right, you've, you've each done a couple. I want to take a little break. We've got uh, a few more. Mary Jo's top stories that fell under the radar. <laughs> Paul's, yep. this is the stuff Paul's I... Paul's stories that he swept under the rug. I swept under the rug. <laughs> and, uh, and they're going to c coincide in the next one. Something they both agree uh, was big. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, a word from 23 and me. It's a great holiday gift idea. In fact, I sent 23 and me to my mom and my sister, and uh, dad's going to get one. It's great for the family. Let me tell you what 23 and me is. So cool. 23 and me. Well, the name comes from your 23 
unique chromosomes, the things that make you, you. 23andMe is a genetic analysis service that's really easy to use and very affordable. In fact, it's really, it's kind of cool that it's become so affordable to, to do this thing that used to be, you know, unattainable. How long ago? I mean, we just did the human genome only maybe less 10, 10 years ago, something like that. Now, for for a you know seventy nine dollars or one hundred forty nine dollars, you can you can do your genome. What the what? All you have to do is spit into a vial. Uh, my mom and my sister already have. They open their presents early, and then in a couple of weeks, you're going to get your report. Actually, the reports are really really cool. Ancestry traits. Uh, DNA relatives. Actually, I talked to my sister and I said, you know, I found a relative in here, uh, Tony Jacoby. She said, yes, you know Tony. <laughs> He's your second cousin. You, there's a picture of us with him. Oh, well, so it works. <laughs> it works. Uh, there he is, my second cousin, Anthony Jacoby. It's so funny. And then I guess some of these I might know. I don't know. So this is one of the things that's fun to do. You have to give them permission, of course. You say, yes, you can share it. You can match up. Anything you can match up, let me know. And uh, you'll find some DNA close and distant relatives. You can search. The reports also include the ancestry. A lot of people love these. The ancestry reports are fabulous. I'm 39% British and Irish, which makes you wonder, what's the rest? Well, I have uh, Southern European, Italian, Iberian. I have a 0.1% Ashkenazi Jew in there. I don't know where that, where, where in the family that came from. I love finding out this stuff. Uh, and you can ask your, you know, when you send a share, see, it's mo like I'm all from there. It's, <laughs> I, but I'm, if I'm going to point that out, I should also point out uh, if I look at the maternal haplogroup on here, uh, you can see how your people migrated over time. So we all started, my, my, the Laportes started 65,000 years ago, uh, actually 180,000 years ago in Central Africa, migrated north through the Middle East up into Europe. 47,000 years ago, we kind of started getting into Europe. That kind of stuff is really fun. Uh, a great thing to share with your kids, too, if you want them to kind of understand the real, practical, important stuff that people are uh, discovering now, thanks to genetics, this is a great way to do it. You can also get your entire DNA raw data, and I've used this to search for specific DNA markers that I've read about. Do I have that marker? The traits tell you things like asparagus odor detection. I have I I likely can't taste bitter, and I likely prefer salty. Yes and yes, likely little upper back hair. You know you probably just look in a mirror, but it's still fun. No bald spot, no dimples, no cleft chin. These are things that you are likely or unlikely. Remember, the DNA is just a starting point. Likely little or no unibrow according <laughs> according to my gene. So here's what you do: you're going to get a vial. You you get to send them a small saliva sample. In a prepaid package, you'll get your personal online report. There's no bloods, no needles, no need to visit a doctor or anything like that. They offer 75 online genetic reports in categories like ancestry, wellness, traits, carrier status. I just, I just love this. And what a great, fun holiday gift. And then you can sit around the Christmas tree and compare genes. This, this holiday, give a gift that's as unique as the ones you love with a DNA kit from 23 and me now through December 26th get up to $50 each off each kit when you go to 23andme.com/twit make the holidays even more special with 23 and me 2323andme.com/twit we thank them for their support of Windows Weekly you guys should do it. And you can see if you're related. You I, seem to. You I, seem I, can, I don't need to do it now because I know that I'm not related to you. How, how do you know that? Ba based on the, uh, the the unibrow, the back hair. You got the, it all. You got it all, my <laughs> friend. You got it yeah. all. Uh, ching ching ching. But I think you and Mary Jo are a little bit on the same uh, track when it comes to your Microsoft <laughs> stories because you you have one that. Who wants to describe this one? I can take I'm a crack at it. All right. Um. So we both picked the whole idea of Windows as a service being a big story uh, for 2017. And the reason I made it a pick was I feel like up until this year, 
it was really chaotic trying to help people understand how this worked, what it was, what it wasn't. Um, and I feel like Microsoft's starting to get the definitions of this down a little bit more, especially now that they're syncing up the releases with uh, Office 365 Pro Plus. So they're saying every uh, twice a year in March, around March and around October, September, October, you're going to see a feature update to Office Pro, uh, Office Pro Plus, and to Windows 10. So I feel like finally there's a cohesive, more cohesive story. Um, but in the end, Windows as a service is more about the service part of this than Windows. You know, all of the people who are Windows insiders and people who listen to our show, you, you're very obsessed with what the latest Windows features are that's in a new test build, you know, of course. Um, but if you really look at why Microsoft did what they're doing um, in terms of coming out with Windows twice, a uh, Windows feature update twice a year, it's all about the service part of it, right? That's what they care. They don't really, I mean, I'm not going to say they don't care about the features, but the features all in all are fairly minor for the most part. I'm just going out on a limb and saying that. I'm sure I'll but hear from not, not Fluent many Design years. System, obviously. That's huge. Yeah, huge. Yeah, fluent Design. Even is though you like can't see it, it's the working the behind the scenes. End all. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the service part is the part I think that they finally, at least definitionally, <laughs> have started to get a handle on. In terms of actually implementing it correctly, not so much, but they're starting to get there. So that was hmm. why I made it a pick this year. Oh. I don't know why Mary Jo hates translucency so much, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't hate it. I, it's just <laughs> I, I feel okay. like Windows <laughs> as a service is going to make my list every year if we do this every year, right? I, I mm -hmm. it's it is it is the nougaty center around which everything I do revolves. I I really feel like it's weird because I understand why they're doing it. I, I th it's a two prong thing too, right? There's the the thing to tell the public, which is that, you know, this is better for everyone. It's more secure and, and whatever. And, and yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's also a little bit for them too, isn't it? Right. It's easier for Microsoft if they don't have 117 different platforms to support every time there's a zero day attack or whatever. The thing is, it really is uh, a mess in, in many ways. Um, you know, in 2017 was kind of interesting on a number of levels. Um, on the one hand, they did what I, I, I know they will do all the time now, which is just extend the supported life cycle for a version of Windows 10 that they said they weren't going to support because their enterprises demand it and nobody wants to be on this system. And, and that's the obvious catch-22 of this system. On the other hand, they released two major versions of Windows 10, two uh, feature updates, we will call them, the creators update in the spring and then the fall creators update in the fall. And guess what? They went really well, right? <laughs> um, I don't care how cynical you are. Both of these things rolled out uh, very smoothly. You know, and this was not something we could have said in 2016. So I don't know. I, I feel very strongly that uh, like a lot of things that Microsoft does, it's the right, it's the right idea. It's the wrong thing for its customers. You know, um, <laughs> Windows 10 S kind of fall. No, I know it's a weird thing to say, but I, there are a lot of things at Microsoft that kind of fall into this um, category. And a lot of them come out of the windows group, whatever that's worth. Um, <laughs> You know, they're in a weird position with Windows 10 because it is a legacy operating system and the world is racing forward with mobile and web and online stuff and cloud. And uh, this could very easily get lost in the mist, you know. And so they're trying to keep it for, at the forefront. They're adding new features, whether we want them or not. And um, here we go, right down the train track at full speed. And it's it's kind of a mixed bag, you know, for mm -hmm. sure. But I, I don't think we're ever going to escape it. I mean, I, I, yeah. I feel like we're going to be stuck with this. For the lifetime of the product, which is apparently yeah. infinity, infinity. So, <laughs> yeah, I I know I've seen a lot, especially on server. You see a lot of a lot of pushback, right? Like client, you yeah. see some, especially for enterprises deploying this. They're like, it's too fast. We can't keep up, you know. But you you it's do have fast. eighteen months, right? Um, I like your idea, by the way. You had said a couple of shows ago, look, make the spring one a major update, make the other one an R two yeah. update, like a minor update, and I think that's. That's a kind of a, a happy compromise between my suggestion, which is stop, and, <laughs> you know, their idea, which is like update, update, update. I mean, yeah. I sort of feel like once a year would be okay. But you know what? Major minors, that works too. That's fine. Right. And as long as you can delay it for, you know, you don't have to take the update till for 18 months if you're, a, yeah. any, I guess, everybody except home, right? 
right. people have a right. way to defer it. Um, Which, by the way, itself is still kind of a major problem, right? That yeah. these guys are, are, are unwilling uh, guinea pigs and there's nothing they can do to stop it. Nothing elegant. Right. Right. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's not going to go away. I don't, even on the server, I don't see them just saying, you know, what, we're just going to do it once a year. Or the, on, right. on the server, what they say to you is, if you don't want to go that fast, just stay on the version we call long-term servicing channel, which in server's case is, 20, is yeah. Windows Server 2016. And if you just stay on that and you don't take these updates, you can just stay there, right, for the duration of that product. You don't have that option in client to just stay. I mean, you do if you if you go long-term servicing channel, but they try to dissuade you from doing that on the <laughs> I was, client. Uh, <laughs> I was upstairs using a Mac the other day on Tuesday. What? And, uh, what? I, Hold on. I, Oh, whoa, 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 I routinely test other systems, you know this, and yeah. um, I was on Twitter and I noticed somebody said, hey, it's Patch Tuesday, make sure you look for all your updates, and they posted a screenshot, that's very Richard to somebody, posted a screenshot of all the updates coming flying down, so just for the heck of it, I went to uh, the App Store, which is how you do this on the Mac, and check for updates, and there were no updates, and that was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice not having to interrupt my day to Apple install it. has... Yeah. Uh, demonstrated sneaky updates though I, I think Microsoft can do this too right an update that doesn't tell you and just doesn't oh sure mm. yeah sure. they did that with a uh, that root login thing they just fixed oh, everybody oh that's right yeah yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah the root thing right I've, have you seen Microsoft ever do that just a silent fix yes um, I'm they trying to think what it, formats um, are with the they just did it with the Windows 7 thing didn't they where, they, or they was hide just things Windows in in kind of a KB and they don't but tell they you that still it's like, it still shows up in update and and oh, I see what you're saying. No, this thing didn't. You wouldn't know you were updated. Oh, oh. Leo, if you um walked out the door every day and somebody just kicked you in the face, and it <laughs> yes. happened every single day. Yes. By the 117th day, you'd stop paying attention to this. And I think with Windows updates, it kind of works like that. Like you we don't just don't even, even you know, it's like you don't even look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just fine. I'm gonna get kicked in the face. I'll reboot it. Whatever. Just actually, leave me Apple's alone. been doing it uh, every month because what they do, and they also don't tell people this, is they have a uh, malware like much like malicious software removal tool that Microsoft mm. offers. They have right. a right. malware screening tool that gets auto updated uh, silently. I mean, it, there's no way you would know it got updated. Uh, yeah. fact, a lot of people I'm, you know, know I'm okay with that if, if as you long can't as that's do that in an enterprise product. I think that's really the issue. No, okay. Well, that's Windows, not a good idea. Worth, yeah. We we if you want to see it, you can. Uh, your Windows Defender will be updated silently, but if you go to Windows Update and check, you'll often see a Windows update. I'm yeah. sorry, Windows Defender update in there. Okay. Um, okay. It's just usually new um, profile. What do you call them? Uh, malware profiles or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Definitions. Right? Yeah. 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 Definitions. Yeah. No reboot. Nothing like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Windows is a service. Wass. Wass. <laughs> that was uh, Paul's item one, Mary Jo's item three. Uh, let's go. Who's next? Should we do Paul for item four? I, uh, we can't. Oh, Mary, Mary, Mary Jo's been going first, but I, I don't. Okay. Then go Mary Jo, your item four, please. <laughs> okay. 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 So my next one was bundling is back in a big way, baby. Bundles and what I mean by that is, you know, Microsoft's kind of known for bundling things together. Look at Office, right? Bundle a lot of different parts together, sell it as a suite. Um, they do that with a lot of other Azure services and other products. But this year, they made the ultimate bundle, Microsoft 365, <laughs> right? Yep. This is the biggest bundle of all bundles, right? Windows 10, Office 365, Enterprise Mobility Plus Security, all bundled together. And if you think you're not going to hear that much about this. I've got news for you. Going forward, your, everything is going to be Microsoft 365. You're not even going to hear them talk as much anymore about Office 365. It's going to be Microsoft 365 powered, Microsoft 365 based devices. This is their new catchphrase. Mm -hmm. And we need to ask Chris Capicella about this next week because um, I'm I'm kind of interested why in the why. I mean, part of the why obviously is if you can get somebody to buy in on this, they're going to buy your whole stack instead of just one product. Uh, but I, I'm curious too what they think in terms of the branding. Like, do they think the Windows and the Office brands ever just go away and it becomes Microsoft everything? They, he hinted, I think, last holiday show so that they were going that way. Let me ask you so a question. That, tell me, tell yeah. me if you think this makes sense. 
Um, well, the big argument for Office 365 is that in the past, if you were an exchange customer, for example, they couldn't yeah. update Skype for Business or SharePoint or whatever with any understanding that you might or might not have all of the products. That that you know, yeah. once you get all of them together in a bundle, they can update them together. They can have cross product functionality that you know they might have done in the past before, but it would have mm -hmm. been optional and there would have been no way to know if everyone had everything. Does it make yeah. sense for Microsoft to develop Windows in Office and I guess the whatever mm -hmm. else is in there, the management security stuff? In tune. As, yep. In tune, yeah. As a integrated product, you know, in other words, yep. uh, obviously there are things in Windows that benefit Office, but there could be features mm -hmm. in Windows that wouldn't be there unless Office was assumed. They, you know? They've hinted that, right? Even when we were at the Surface, um, Surface Book 2 launch, they talked mm -hmm. about how they say they, they built that product by sitting everybody down in the room and saying, here's, how do right. we light these features up from Office in Windows? How do we design something, right? So yeah, I think I think you're right on that. Totally right. I'm curious to see what. Yeah, I wonder. Well, I'll look, look forward to that. You know, at the um, uh, the Snapdragon event last week, Terry yeah. Morris, and I'm going to get the wording wrong, but he he said that Office 365 was the way he described it. I think he meant the Office applications, but mm -hmm. Office 365 was something like custom tailored or custom optimized or something for the ARM chipset. You know, in other words, hinting that the version yeah. that ran on that product was a little bit different, maybe because it had to be just for performance characteristics or whatever, but that there's an interesting symbiosis of the OS, the application stack, and the hardware, which right, right now is kind of brand new. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting hint, the way they worded it, because when I yeah. first thought about that, I thought they were talking about a version of Office that will work well in emulation on Windows on ARM. That's what I thought they meant. That actually probably is yeah. what that means. In other words, yeah. there's probably a straight, in other words, emulation, actually, I think the guy from Qualcomm might have confirmed this. Um, the emulation software was written by Microsoft and it um, just works generally. You can run an app and it runs. And I think I, I think I asked on the podcast, I think the question along the lines of, could, would this thing be customized, much like Xbox backward compatibility, on an app-by-app -app basis. And I think it was him yeah. who said, yes, it would be. And yep. maybe that's a, a great example of that because Office is a complex set of applications and might need mm -hmm. to be optimized for that chipset. Yeah, set. for sure. I think I think it does. You know, like they like said, they're going to look at the top 100 apps by usage yeah, and yeah. optimize those first, right? Or work with third parties to optimize those first. But yeah, um, where did that come from? I where think did, that's that what from? they Was meant. that in his speech? Was that, did no, Terry say that? that they just told me that, I think, um, when I was talking to them before the event. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I, I, I remember hearing that, but I don't remember yeah. where. I think I said right. it, or some yes, other people may have said, said it, it too. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I often do that to people. I don't know why. Uh, Mary Jo, did you hear that they're going to optimize the top 100 apps? <laughs> You're like, yeah, I yeah. told you that, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Paul, your Paul turn, my friend. Nice. Yeah. yeah, so again, kind of in the pro and the con thing, um, 2017 was a really big year for AR and for VR. Um, and it's interesting because Microsoft was obviously right at the forefront on the AR thing with HoloLens uh, starting a couple of years ago, maybe last year. Uh, but that's not a mainstream solution. It's a very vertical and niche uh, solution, mostly for businesses. Um, and then this year, of course, on uh, Apple, but also on the Google platform, you see an iOS and Android. AR becoming an integrated part of the platform. And um, and how cool that kind of stuff could be. I don't know if you saw this, Leo or Mary Jo, but this past week I got the AR stickers add-in for the Google Pixel 2 yep. camera app. And mm -hmm. you can put these little Star Wars stickers and or Star Wars holograms, whatever. And I did like a walk around of a stormtrooper standing in my uh, sunroom. And it's like he's that. in the sunroom. Yeah, that you was know, pretty there's, cool. There's, yeah, and it, the volume's a little low. I don't know why. It wasn't as low when I did it in real life, but the, there's a realistic shadow of the guy on the floor. He, he reacts a little bit as I, go, as I get close, and when I get up in his face, he kind of leans in and he says, move along. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is this and, on your uh, Twitter? Where can I find this? It's on YouTube, so um, I think it's maybe youtube.com slash the rot. You didn't tweet it? Yeah, I, yeah, you I did, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'll get to it there. 
And now the podcast will be interrupted by an even larger animal because now we have a dog. <laughs> oh, I know. How big is that dog? I saw a picture. It's uh, as big as I am. Um, giant. <laughs> it's giant. Uh, she probably. He's got some little up, like pug or something. He's he's that's like. That's what I was gigantic. looking for. I was you know medium sized dog at the most. Um, we got this thing. It's, you know, it's like a rescue animal. I know. And, uh, what kind of dog is he? It's not really clear. Sorry. It's it's kind of like um. <laughs> I keep, I want, keep wanting to call it a snickerdoodle. It's a labradoodle mix of some kind of. Oh, I know, like right. what? <laughs> it's a delicious cookie-flavored dog. I'm not a dog person. <laughs> Labradoodles um, are great. Is it a labradoodle? Yeah, it is. It, but it's black. You know, it's kind of black. Here, let me see. Show his face. <laughs> oh, they're the greatest. Very nice dogs. The big difference between dogs and cats, aside from size, is that the cats don't really care when you leave. And when you leave, it is the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to a dog. Oh. <laughs> if you don't bring her, if you don't bring her with you, like if you are going to go anywhere outside, it could be the backyard, it could be for an hour long walk, it could be in the car, which is ideal. The dog wants to go no matter what it is. But if it's um, that's a sweet. If, if it's you leaving without her, oh, not a happy situation. No. All right, here we go. As we uh, here's another pet of Paul's, a little <laughs> friendly AR stormtrooper. In his, in his, oh, I'm not hearing the audio. Shoot. Oh. The audio is super low and there's, there's nothing until the very end. I see audio coming through, but I don't. Wow. That's very realistic. It's crazy. There it is. Yeah. And it's that stormtrooper voice, yeah. you know? Yeah. These, we, I, I, let, we can I'm let these two go. Me. They don't, uh, whatever. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> That is that is a really neat effect. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I had sort of said, without, I didn't need to see this, but once you sort of see some early AR demos, demos on mo mobile, you realize, oh, this is the where this is going to be successful. There's yes, no doubt about it. absolutely. Because everybody has a smartphone. Um, yeah, and it, and it's your device that you have with you all the time. Yeah. That you can move around with it. You know, it's obvious, right? But the it's, other a, thing it's that, you know, a little quickie thing because, uh, yeah. remember, you know, you're not going to hold your phone. I mean, who wants to stand around holding their device all the time like that. That's kind right. of a... But there are some yeah. neat uses for it, and it's not just the stormtrooper in your room. It's like, uh, you know, the the great example, you know, go to a museum and you can hold up the phone in front of a dinosaur skeleton and see what the dinosaur looked like in the phone. And um, there are some neat uses uh, for it. Where did you get those energy. stickers? I want those. <laughs> so it's part of the Google Pixel camera app, so you have to have one of those phones. I do. Okay, so if you update the phone... Yeah, it, it's in the app. So if if you, oh, you if don't it's need updated, any physical stickers. No. So if you go to the camera app, okay, um, and bring down the menu, the hamburger menu, you yeah. should see an AR stickers item. In oh the yeah, list. yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, I didn't even that know stuff. that. Yeah, it just happened. Yeah, look at that. So that's cool. Yeah, mm. it's really cool. You get a variety of uh, Star Trek stuff, or you can have a little floating coffee cup. Yep, coffee cup is pretty. Does it not is start, cute. Does it not do it until you press record? No, you can see it in there already. You, you could do video like I did. You could just do a still photo if you want. Um, I put a bunch of X wings in the room the other day. I had like those ATATs running do on you the have floor. To search and tie for it. I don't see it anywhere. Where is? <laughs> well, you got to place it first. So what you oh, do is you drag it down. Oh, you drag it into the scene. I get it. Yeah. I get it. You I could drag it. multiple holograms, for lack of a you know, for, to use Microsoft's okay, word. Okay, got it. I'm gonna put BB-8 right there. All right. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's cool. It's really cool. Wow, Paul. You got BB-8 in your life. And the thing is, you know, if you go back to the original hologram demos or you go back to our original experiences with holograms, whatever complaints one might have had, I mean, I think the, the central genius of that technology was <laughs> its ability to root these objects in real space and have it be realistic. And this stupid little camera thing does that. I would say just about as well. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty impressive. Well, especially since Apple was the one saying, oh, we're going to really eat this up. There's going to be everything. I yeah. mean, uh, wow. This is yeah, who knew the evil computer scientists at Google would just throw it in their app and go, make it work? Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I guess I would just say on the Microsoft front, um, obviously they uh, kind of innovated on AR, right? yeah, whatever. Yeah. But give them a little bit of credit because they did – our, our, I should say, our, did work to bring VR mainstream on the PC by making it part of the platform. And it had two immediate effects. Um, one is everyone dropped their prices, everyone, um, including like Sony, P <laughs> like VR, uh, the PlayStation VR, um, mm -hmm. which doesn't necessarily directly compete with Microsoft. 
or with Windows. Um, but the other thing they did, and I think this is just as important because this is frankly what VR needed, was they really took a huge step toward simplifying the technology. If you've ever set up Oculus Rift or whatever, HTC Vive, you know that it's this incredibly complex series of steps you have to go through and, you know, whatever. And by putting the sensors on the on the helmet, which is what Microsoft has done, um, it just makes the process that much simpler. And you can play it two different ways. You can configure it so you're sitting in front of the desk here like I'm doing. Or, or BB-8's doing in front of you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's, so, it's cool, right? I mean, yeah. He's right there. I mean, I wish you could do this in the selfie camera. You can't because I would put one of those little, what do they call those little <laughs> creatures in the new movie, like the little owl looking things? Yeah. You know, it could like sit on your shoulder or whatever, but they don't, it doesn't work with the front I don't camera. know anything about the new movie, please. No spoilers. <laughs> Thank you. For no, no, it's, it's, it's in the, it's in the ad. I haven't also... been watching the ad. <laughs> My God, Leo. Well, let me tell you what happens. I have, because... shut up. I have tickets tomorrow. <laughs> Bad news. 6 p.m. Yeah. And I didn't, I, you know, the New York Times gave it a very positive review, and I only scanned Basically, it. Basically, everyone did, right? I yeah, mean, it's got, all yeah, the reviewers I trust yeah. were like, oh, my God, this is incredible. Yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> so I don't want to be spoiled by some <laughs> host on one of my shows, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't mind. I haven't seen it. I don't have anything to I'm not going to ruin it for you. I, talking I'm about as this. excited to see it as you are. Porgs? What's that? Porgs, Porgs yes. Porgs. Pork. Actually, Porgs is one of the little <laughs> objects you can add in the camera. Can you add a Porg? In fact, I put them over porg. the plants. I, I tweeted that because I said there's a Porg in the shrubbery. <laughs> this is really fun. Um, I'm, yeah. oh, I'm bad. I literally lost an afternoon because of this thing. They also <laughs> released, Google released for iPhone and uh, Android new um, yeah, camera apps. New camera apps. So they, they, they're really going nuts here. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a Porg. Google Sorry, has um, had some issues with their phone hardware for sure, but the one thing that they have gotten consistently right is the quality of the camera app and the camera hardware. It's incredible. Like I, the, the the Pixel Two XL is a dog on some levels, but the the camera is unbelievably good. It's mm -hmm. really really good. So yep. you know, after you, after you posted these stickers, my first thought mm -hmm. was, what is Microsoft doing in the camera space right now? Right, like they've <laughs> got to be doing something, even though they don't have a phone. And we know yes. they've been doing things around the photo app, Chris Prattley, you know, the remix stuff. But I'm like, they must be doing something a else, right? Out. Like everybody else is using the camera to do AR and VR, right? So I oh. went to Microsoft Careers and I did a search on camera, and only eight jobs came up, and several of them are old. So I'm like, well. Yeah. That's not always the perfect barometer so, of are they doing okay. something, but it's still kind of alarming. You've reminded me that I have not given Microsoft credit for something, which is that oh. um, <laughs> I just don't use this, I guess. Uh, when Intel announced the camera sensor technology that enables Windows Hello, Microsoft had not yet revealed they were going to use it for that purpose. And so some PC makers actually put that camera on the back of the device, right? right? Because you could use it for AR, like like Leo's doing on the phone. And so one thing you can actually do with a Windows tablet, or if you have a Surface device to detach the keyboard or whatever, is what he's doing. In other words, there are AR capabilities just like this that you can do through the back of the computer. So you can actually do this on a Windows 10 PC today. Yeah. Um, there's a 3D. There are 3D apps, and you can take 3D objects, put them into the scene. Yeah, true. Uh, just like he's doing it. So it's kind of a simpler version of AR. It's it, it may be akin to what you're seeing here on the phone, but yeah. um, it is in Windows 10. I actually kind of forgot that was there. I just played with it last week, so I don't know why I forgot about it. But yeah, what um, is that yeah, thing called? Are, the viewer, right? Called, yeah, probably, what is that it used called? To be called mixed, 3D viewer, but I think it's called it's probably just called mixed reality viewer. Mixed now. reality viewer or something. I yeah, so. yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's that's a fair point. This is where not having a mobile platform might hurt a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah, but they, I mean, look, they obviously are working on some mobile stuff, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And um, uh, and we still have this mobile, um, uh, I mean, laptop type platform or tablet platform. I mean, it, it, that does exist. And the, the 3D objects that you can put into the scenes and so forth are fairly sophisticated, actually. They're not, they're not terrible. Mm-hmm. I can't. Okay, I don't want to turn it on because it's going to kill my Skype camera. Yeah. But I could right now add this object to right. the scene that I'm seeing through the camera. And in this case, the camera's facing forward. But on a tablet, yeah. you would hold it like you are with the phone, and you could, you know, add it to the scene, the mm -hmm. the real life scene. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I keep playing with. You. I know. No. Listen. <laughs> it's super predictive. I I literally had a fleet of 
X, uh, X-wing fighters in my uh, sunroom, I guess. <laughs> and then I, it, and then across here I had like walkers, and they they sit there and they they fire laser blasts and stuff, and the the little tie fighters, you know, kind of move. It's 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 it's, it's, it's awesome. I it, just, it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's totally awesome. amazing. It's kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. Look at this. He's shooting. Look <laughs> around. <laughs> 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 Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, I. That's a Google I, product, not a Microsoft product. I lost product. the data. This thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and they give you a lot of stickers. When did this come out? Tuesday or oh man, how did I miss it? A couple okay. days ago. Gosh, I was busy uh, making paper clips. That's why. <laughs> you. That's a long story. You don't really want to know. It's an artificial intelligence game. Uh, that you make paper clips, basically. Yeah, you that's know, okay. uh, it's, this is the how the matrix starts. We'll yeah. see, let's see if we can get the humans to make something simple. And well, then once we'll move on. It's actually the artificial intelligence making the paper clips, and eventually, if you play the if you play your game right, it it uh, actually eats the whole universe. You use up all the matter in the universe, and then and then there's <laughs> nothing. I so what happened is I is I destroyed the universe, so now I'm in a a second universe, destroying and that this, one. Uh, okay, it starts <laughs> small. Starts so small. It's like um, it's like prestiging. It is, but there's like there's little like uh, um, you get. <laughs> it's hard to explain, but believe me, it's fun. <laughs> you get you have to control the economics of it, right? So like I need to do more marketing, right? And then the, then you can <laughs> raise or lower the price of the paper clips. But what eventually happens is you train this artificial intelligence, and uh, and uh, it. Well, the good news is it creates because it gets in the way of paperclip production. It creates world peace and ends global warming. <laughs> Because, but then it also, that's the upside. The downside is it turns all matter, including humans, into paper clips. And then it has to do space exploration. And eventually, thanks to the law of exponential growth, eats it's all unclear. the matter in the universe. How there can be peace in the galaxy without the Porgs. <laughs> I don't know what a Porg is, and I don't want to know. All right, that was uh, your number four. Yep. Mm. What's next? Mary Jo's number five? Yep. yep. Um, so my fifth one is about, it sounds boring, but it's actually got a lot of layers. Partnering, right? So. I think this is a huge um, story. Microsoft's it, done amazing it, things this year. I know. With so Linux, not that even. long ago, Microsoft was known for being very combative with even the people it considered to be its partners. Um, you know, software vendors, they were always what? thinking Microsoft's going to eat our lunch. You know, why, why should we work with them? Then they hired Peggy Johnson from Qualcomm uh, a couple of years ago. And ever since, it's been everybody is a partner and nobody is an enemy, right? Like they partner with Adobe, they partner with Red Hat, they're doing all this open source stuff. And it's great for customers. It, it I'd say like, of course, you know, if you can get Amazon and Microsoft working together on Cortana and Alexa, it's all goodness. But I'm throwing this butt in there. But is is there such a thing as too much partnering? Because sometimes you're you're just kind of sitting around waiting for Microsoft to do something to compete. And then you start thinking, okay, what are they going to do to compete? Example, Alexa and Cortana, right? Um, Microsoft's got this partnership with Amazon now around uh, the two digital assistants working together. But because Amazon's is so dominant, you have to wonder, like, where's the room left for Microsoft's? So for me, the story, the partnering story is huge. It's mostly um, all goodness, nothing but goodness for customers because it gives them choice. But it does make me worry about, has Microsoft gone soft? And are they <laughs> just all love and peace with everybody now? And and not so much about being a competitor. Wow. Hmm. Kind of gentler Microsoft. They've gone soft. Have they gone have soft? Has Microsoft that, gone now, soft? Now, one thing is, you need to get a real computer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I Everything is a computer, though, isn't it? My watch. <laughs> I, Apple, the week uh, that they were launching a new iMac, uh, aired a, a, a commercial in which a girl asked, uh, what is a computer? What's a computer? Yeah. Well, Smart. if you've got five thousand uh, dollars, I'll be glad to make one for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't What's carry a Lamborghini? it around. You can't do any. Yeah, right. What's a Lamborghini, Daddy? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Isn't that funny? They announce a five thousand yeah. dollar computer. 
by the way, they're coming back looking for creators just like Microsoft, right? Of course. This is yeah. like the this Surface is, Studio. It's similar. I mean, it's it more expensive yeah. and it's not, it's much and, more powerful, you know, but. Yeah. Apple well, arguably was the original premium PC maker yeah. when you think about it. I mean, they sort of invented this. Um, yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Okie dokie. Let's see here. You have a number five. And this is this is is this your way of thanking uh, Qualcomm for your trip to? <laughs> no, no. If you um, I, no, you guys know me well enough to know that yeah, no, um, you're too curmudgeonly to do that. Yeah, no. But I I get on these little crusades. You know, progressive web apps is one, and I, and Windows 10 on Snapdragon is another one. And uh, it's I'm very interesting that, watching people in our. Uh, circle, you know, like enthusiasts and so forth, kind of go through the various stages of denial and whatever when it comes when it kind of comes to this stuff. I, no, I feel no. like sometimes, what's that? I'm just saying, no, no yeah. windows on arm. No. Well, I mean, I feel like people <laughs> often can't step out of their own area of need and and have trouble seeing that you know the rest of the world isn't like you. Uh, they don't always wear a Star Trek uniform to work, or <laughs> you know, they <laughs> or you know or whatever. Um, you know, some of us prefer the Carhartt shirts. So uh, Windows 10 on Snapdragon is, is super important for the future of the platform because, you know, we, we've well worn this story. You know, the world has gone mobile, uh, web, and cloud. I just said it earlier today. Um, and here's this, the PC, which I love, and Windows, which I love. And how, how do you adapt these things for this future world? And we've tried on the PC platform to do things like instant on and power management and long battery life, and, you know, with mixed results, frankly. Um and I think the thing that Snapdragon and Qualcomm and ARM in general bring uh, to the equation are uh, a scale of uh, experience with making this stuff work on devices that are out in the real world and actually working. And, um, you know, it's the type of thing, look, let's not pretend we're not playing roulette every time we open our laptop. Is it going to come on? Is it going to come on quickly? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we all, is the battery going to be okay? Did it drain over it? Like we, I, whether you want to admit it or not, we all have that kind of weird doubt. And I, I think part of it is just uh, you know, on the hardware side, we have the same legacy we have on the software side. This thing's been around for a long time and the origins of the stuff we're using were not designed for the current use cases. Um, and so Snapdragon, whether it is successful or not in the market, I don't think it's super important, but Although I think it will be. I, I, what I think it's going to do at the very least is inspire Intel to compete better. And I had conversations at the show with some hardware guys, including Ryan Shroud, by the way, who was on the show. And basically saying, look, Intel's going to catch up to this stuff. It's going to take a couple of years, you know, and um, that will benefit all of us. And so today I would say real world, it's a little bit like Windows 10S. It's not necessarily geared for most people in the real world today, but it's forward leaning. It's kind of looking at the future. And... Um, I think the performance stuff is going to catch up. And I think more important, the equation is going to balance a little bit on the Intel side as well. So uh, this is the shot in the arm that Windows needed. And it's, it, it's the thing I think that will propel the next decade of change or however you want to say that innovation, whatever, uh, because this stuff is only going to get more mobile. And this is the, you know, the right, this is the right direction to head in for sure. Yeah, I think there is a group. I, I like your idea of not everybody is like you. Not everybody is like ev the listeners of this podcast who want the most yeah. powerful PC that can do everything. Yep. Uh, I That's why it's good I'm here because I represent <laughs> little, the, yep. the normal Dash of reality. The people, <laughs> the yeah. people who yeah. like mostly do web browsing and some light app stuff on their PC and they don't need a Surface Book 2, right? And that's who these things I think are going to be really good for. And in the enterprise, there are a lot of people like that. Of course, there are people who are creators and who need the most powerful everything and the best and the biggest and gamers need that too. But there are people who are information workers who don't and they their computing needs are pretty simple. There are people who could use Chromebooks and that's where right. Windows 10 Snapdragon comes, comes Actually, in that, for the, sure. The Chromebook thing is really smart because... Yep. It really does target the same kind of user. And, and by kind mm -hmm. of user, I don't mean like business user or consumer. I mean yeah. that a lot of people, arguably most people, can get most of what they need to get done from a sort of personal computing perspective on a phone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, though, they need to sit down in front of a big screen or a bigger screen and have a real keyboard and a mouse or whatever and type and get, yeah. you know, write a paper or edit a, you know, a spreadsheet or whatever it is. 
And um, and that's what this kind of thing speaks to. These aren't like the yeah. burner, low end, garbage yeah. education class laptops we saw in the spring. These are at priced rights five hundred, seven hundred dollars in that price range. Mainstream, you know, this is yeah. hitting the mainstream part of the market, and that's interesting because when you look at growth in the PC market, you don't see it broadly, but you see it in these little niche categories: gaming, premium PCs, and maybe a few others. This is yeah. trying to bring some growth back to the mainstream part of the PC market, mm -hmm. which is still quite sizable. Yeah. Um, and people are looking, or actually people are probably not looking to replace PCs, which is the problem. Um, this is something that will have, a, I think, a more long-lasting impact mm -hmm. on the future of the platform um, because otherwise people will buy Chromebooks or yeah. we'll just keep using the you know aging I almost said 46, yeah. probably not that old. The aging <laughs> Core 2 Duo, yeah. whatever they're using. Yeah. Um, because they only need it every once in a while to print mm -hmm. or to, you know, look at something on a screen. Yeah. They just have to not make this be Netbook 2.0, right? If it is that, right. then it's going to come to the same fate in the end. Yeah, I I feel like it's not, uh, although maybe maybe I'm being irrational here. I mean, the it, the thing about netbooks is that there was no way to get around the hardware problem, right? Uh, yeah. At least with the netbooks, if you had Windows 10, or not Windows 10, whatever version, Windows Vista Starter or something, mm -hmm. um, Windows 7 Starter, you could upgrade that to a better version of Windows. You could kind of solve that problem. It's not like Windows 10S where, or I should say Windows RT, where you were stuck. It was, a, I call Windows yeah. RT kind of a... Uh, a one-way dead-end street, right? If you went down mm -hmm. that road and you said, oh, I want to run Chrome, sorry, there was no way you could do that. Um, yeah. That's the night. That's the one nice thing about Windows 10 S. You, you can upgrade it. I mean, it's quick and it's easy and it works. You can get that stuff going. Um, it's a different hardware platform, uh, but it still runs x86 apps, you know? Mm -hmm. And if it's going to be slow, and I think it is, um, it's still better to be a little slow for that one app that you have to have than for it not to work. It's still better to be able to install the drivers for the custom scanner software, or whatever it is, the fact that that works mm -hmm. is what I think makes the whole thing work. Yeah. Well, there you go, folks. Five See you next year. And five. <laughs> bye bye. <the> best, <laughs> most interesting and least reported Microsoft stories. I think you guys hit on it. And I think if people have been listening to Windows Weekly all year long, they'll recognize each of the, uh, these stories and the importance of these stories. I mean, these are the stories we covered, maybe not others, yeah. but uh, except for the reorganization of the sales staff, I don't think we really did that justice. Yeah, I think we right. touched on it for sure, but... Yeah. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. Uh, have you, have we really talked about everything there is to say about Windows 10 on Snapdragon? You kind yeah, of, yeah, I think we've pretty kind of much merged covered a lot of the it, next although, item there. What is the last, is that something? eSIM. Did you want to talk about the eSIM yeah. stuff, Mary Jo? I could talk about this a little bit. So, um, while we were all distracted by Hawaii, <laughs> Microsoft was having another whoa, whoa, event. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft was having a WinHack event. Who knew? In Taipei. Wow. And... Uh, they do these periodically where they bring their OEMs and ODMs in and they talk to them about different features that they want them to build into their next generation devices. So it was very interesting. They posted up the slides from this and there were a couple slide decks that talked about these always connected PCs. Um, what I found interesting was there are some features coming to Windows. I don't know if it will be Redstone 4 or 5 but there, there are more features coming that are going to make it um, easier to use these kinds of devices and deploy them inside of enterprises uh, that don't exist yet in Windows 10. One of them was um, all around eSIM technology and how end users will be able to download eSIM profiles from the cloud and not have to go through their mobile operators or retailers. They're going to add that in to make it easier for people to just get connected and use eSIMs. Um, inside PCs that are already built in. And then there's something called Enterprise eSIM, which is going to let companies who buy these kinds of always connected PCs in bulk automatically provision them using mobile device management software like Intune. And they said that's going to be piloted in the next version of Windows 10. So they're doing a lot of things around power management and eSIM technology in Windows 10. Maybe we'll see some of these soon or hear about them in that 25-page blog post that they're working on. Um, but, yeah, they, they definitely have more up their sleeves around uh, always connected PC technology being 
better implemented by the operating system. So that's all. Just some WinHex stuff. Cool. Uh, not to get too far down the Qualcomm rabbit hole because, you know, I'm slyly just promoting everything they do. Um, <laughs> no, you're not. No, you're not. Uh, no, it's okay. I I did go to Hawaii last week, by the way. That was awesome. I don't know if I did mentioned you? that. Um, no, they, uh, it's not just Qualcomm. I mean, you know, 5G is coming. And, and one of the promises of 5G is that um, not just pervasive connectivity, but pervasive instant connectivity right and how interesting it is when you just can access anything online immediately download a movie to your phone in seconds so you can watch it offline um, cloud storage goes from being like you know awesome to being just obvious it becomes electricity and um, i think these always connected pcs obviously today we're talking you know gigabit lte if you're lucky um, but still very good connectivity. I mean, I, this is this is that thing I was talking about earlier where, you know, Qualcomm getting involved with the platform kind of helps make this stuff a little more seamless, you know, there. But that's true on, on Intel too, right? Because it, But Intel, by the way, well, you know, Intel has their own modems actually, but you could have a Qualcomm. There are PCs today that have Qualcomm modems, but whatever the yeah. modem, it doesn't matter. Um, the yeah. point here is that when you open the lid of your laptop, it should just turn on. It doesn't always today. Uh, and the other thing that should happen is you could be you should be connected no matter where you are. And so, if you're uh, one thing that uh, that phones do better than PCs, but PCs do this too, is switch seamlessly between networks. Um, and I don't just mean switch like from like cellular to Wi-Fi. I mean to constantly be monitoring the situation and always use the best network. Um, and again, not just cellular to Wi-Fi. It's like something Project Fi does mm -hmm. on the Google phones where. You don't have to think of, you know, in my near, you know, no one knows where CDMA or GSM towers are or who owns them or what frequencies they are. You know, it's always working, you know, to make sure that you have the best connection. This is the type of thing that's going to really impact the PC platform. We already, we, we do it on mobile. We don't think about it. We don't even know what's mm -hmm. happening, you know. Yeah. Uh, and if this works on the PC, it should be just the, the same seamless experience. Yeah. All right, more Windows uh, 10 news coming up. Uh, but first, a word from Blue Apron. Uh, I know you guys love to cook. I love to cook. Maybe there are a few people out there who think, ah, you know, I'd cook, but it's so hard to figure out what to cook. I actually, in this group, plan a meal, then shop for it. And this is one of the reasons I love Blue Apron, because Blue Apron sends me these incredible boxes filled with, perfect ingredients and a recipe card and uh, three different meals, either for a couple or for a family of four. And uh, is there so much fun to cook, 45 minutes or less. They're very affordable. They actually cost less than they would if you went and bought them at a grocery store because they, you know, they don't have the brick and mortar to pay for. And, and you just get this great experience. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. And for good reason. They're, they have a mission. They're on a mission to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, building a community of home chefs. Blueapron.com slash windows if you want to learn more. It's not a subscription. You don't have to worry. You're not going to get boxes when you don't expect them. You only, uh, what you do is you, you know, when it's time, you go to blueapron.com and you click the menu, uh, you know, item and you see what's on the menu and by the way if you don't get excited when you see this is new they've added categories so this is trending customer favorite 30 minute meal they brought back some of the most popular dishes seared chicken and mashed potatoes with mushroom pan sauce yeah well of course that's a favorite look at this a 30 minute meal spicy smoked trout sandwiches with roasted sweet potato we got some vegetarians in the house Basil, pesto, pasta, and broccoli with roasted carrots. The thing is, you're going to learn when you uh, techniques like the roasted carrots technique. You're going to go, that was so good. I'm going to make it again and again. You see exactly what ingredients you get there. Perfect. And by the way, the roasted carrots, you get three carrots, not a bunch. There's no waste. You get one lemon. So you get exactly what you need, which in a way makes it easier to make because you know that, you know, if you haven't used everything, you've not done yet. There are 12 new recipes each and every week. You could pick two, three, or four recipes based on what best fits your schedule. A lot of people want to just, you know, do it the whole week. Some people say, eh, just a couple of a couple of meals. Roasted broccoli and fregola sarda salad with hard-boiled eggs and tahini dressing. Sheet pan pork pitas. Oh, my God, I'm so hungry now. 
Mmm. Spicy shrimp bucatini with cabbage and toasted breadcrumbs. Oh, cooking together is great. And you know what? It's There's a couple of reasons Blue Apron would be fantastic. For date night, if you want to impress somebody and you, and you cook an amazing meal for date night, I'm telling you, you don't have to tell them you got it from Blue Apron. Hide the box and they will just go, wow, uh, you're a keeper. For your, If you're already in a family, this is so great for the kids. First of all, we all know eating meals together is important, but cooking them even adds to that. It builds strong family bonds. You have fun together. And guess what? Your kids are going to learn a few things about cooking, which will do them well in the future. You don't want a child that lives at Burger King. Take the recipes you love, add your own family twist, and once you've made any Blue Apron meal, you will feel the confidence to make it again and again. I know it's true for me. Beef medallions and brown butter caper sauce with Italian spiced tomatoes, uh, potatoes and turnip. <gasps> Blue Apron is treating our listeners to their first three meals. That's a $30 value when you go to blueapron.com slash windows. You get free shipping to blueapron.com slash windows. Check out this week's menu. And get $30 off with free shipping. Blueapron.com slash windows. We thank them so much for bringing cooking back into my life. They're, you know, Napster brought music back into my life. Blue Apron brought <laughs> cooking back into my life. <laughs> oh. No, I really, I'm not kidding. It just reminded me of how much fun it is. How much I like it. The Google it. Uh, camera app brought Star Wars back. Into ah, life. maybe. Brought the Porg back. All right, let's talk about uh, Windows 10. Actually, this is an interesting story. People aren't using Microsoft Edge. Yeah, we kind of already knew that. <laughs> and you, you might recall uh, a story from, I don't know, a couple of months ago where Microsoft claimed, I think at a developer event, that there were 330 million active users of Microsoft Edge. Now, I hear that. It's funny because I'm terrible at math, but... I do a lot of math in my job for some reason because that didn't make any sense for me and to me. And I did everything I could to try to figure out how it could be possible that that many people were using Edge and it 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 just didn't compute. Um, and using the the metrics of the day, uh, stat counter or net application, you could kind of figure out well how many people are browsing the web on PCs, what percentage are using. <laughs> Both of my iPhones just sprung to life for some reason. I said something that sounded like their personal assistant, apparently. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. This, is, this job just gets hotter and harder every day. So <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you know, Edge had anywhere, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was single digit, you know, usage share. There was just no way. Well, Stack or not Stack Hunter, Net Applications uh, recently discovered that a lot of their traffic was being skewed by bots. And uh, they've had to recalculate. And uh, what they found was that about, uh, well, uh, the edge Chrome, usage Chrome is, about, is the top line, the dark blue line. Yeah, it's about 60%. 60%. Mm -hmm. The light blue is the very bottom line, under 5%, it looks like. Yeah, it's, well, yeah, it's well flat, under, by the way. <laughs> very flat. Yeah, it's, uh, you know? if, you, if you listen closely, you can hear. <laughs> it does look like a flat line. line. Uh, Firefox uh, yeah. and Internet Explorer kind of tied around... A little more than ten, maybe between ten and yep. twenty percent, about fifteen percent. But to be declining clear, on the there, desk. and yep. and Chrome going up. Yeah, mm. I mean that's it's kind of incredible. Yeah, so that's Chrome a one, is the new IE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. Wow. So yeah, and I, you know, again, uh, sort of like Xbox. I mean, I, within the context of why do they even make this product, it's kind of hard to say. Um, I do feel like they've done many of the right things. They did add the mobile app, which I think is crucial uh, for the people that do want to use the browser. I sort of evaluate it from a quality standpoint on an ongoing basis. And certainly every time there's a new Windows 10 version, that's when all the, the feature changes happen. I sort of hold it up against the browser I'm using at the time. I say, well, how does this match up? And it never does. You know, it, it it's okay. It's okay. It's definitely gotten better over time. There's no doubt about it. I mean, every version of Windows 10 uh, Edge gets better. It's a fact. Um, but it's kind of astonishing how few people use it. And it's something on the order of, I'm doing this off the top of my head, I, I want to say it's slightly under 1 in 10 of the number of people who use Windows 10. Wow. 
Wow. Or even using the browser wow. to browse the web. Why is that, Which do you is, think? Because it's the default. Microsoft bugs you yeah. if you try to switch away from it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the world has changed. Um, I, I think... The tyranny the, of the default no longer holds sway. Well, it, it does in some ways. You know, it depends on the platform. But um, Internet Explorer was declining for so long. I think people might have looked at Firefox early on and then Chrome more recently and said, hey, this thing works great. I'm just going to use this. And as they move forward to Windows 10, they're, they're, they're just comfortable. You know, uh, this is, I, I'm saying this cynically. I'm not serious. But I mean... You know, I will use Microsoft Edge once to install Google Chrome, and then we'll move on from there. And I, 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 I believe that to be the norm. I, that belief is supported by numbers, <laughs> in facts, yeah. um, and just general usage. I mean, that is what's happening out there in the world. So I don't know. <clears throat> I, I yeah. does beg the question: Why they even bothered yeah. to do? This, you mm. know? Well, but I just I won't mention. They didn't PDF, know PDF ahead of time. Right? I mean, how would they know? Well, they must have seen the, you know, the I trends, know. I right? Think, I think when they when they introduced Edge, it was to try to get people off of IE 11 and to get them yeah. excited again about Microsoft's browser because people spend so much time in the browser, right? And right. I think they probably right. are surprised that it's not doing better. But I, you know, there's it's still lacking a lot of plugins that people want and. Once you get, once you start using things that are connected to a browser, um, you know, your extensions, your bookmarks, all that, it, I think it's just habit, right? You just say, I'm already using Chrome, so I might as well use it everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, for whatever it's worth, I, I, I do believe that the, the, not the cost, the, the difficulty of switching is low. Um, you can pick yeah. up a browser oh, it's on easy. mobile or yeah. it's easy. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. It, any browser will import all your stuff. But Mary Jo has a point. The, the extensions, once you get used to those. I know. Yep. Yep. And if you don't have the one one or two that you really That's all need or want. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yep. I know. So Google's been uh, smart. Microsoft, they built in lock-in, really. Yeah. Uh, when, when Microsoft announced Windows 10S, uh, I believe it was at that event, they said that basically, you know, based on their own understanding of uh, metrics or of uh, telemetry, rather, that users spend over fifty percent of their time in Windows on the web, right? Yeah. And so you might make the argument that that's why they made it because uh, that means those people are using Chrome, and that means that in the future it might be much easier for them to move forward to a Chromebook, and that could and explain Chrome maps, why. Right? You know, uh, you know any anything that Google makes, yeah. right? So that might be the why. Um, yeah. Uh, I I you know. If you believe, like I do, that PWA is the future, um, having a strong web rendering engine and integrated OS capabilities is key. Microsoft will have those. Um, so mm -hmm. we could all become edge users in the next year, uh, basically, by running these apps and not even realize it. Um, that will yeah. make a difference. Yeah, I think they're tying some features to edge still, too, like sets that's coming. You know, that that's going to work with edge, right? As far as the browser yeah. goes, so that would be and this, smart. And, that would yeah, be smart. the continue on PC stuff is all edge based. So, if yeah. you were in, I'm going to make up a random. Oh, you were in Microsoft Word on your iPhone, and your default browser back on your PC is uh, Chrome, and mm -hmm. you said, "Well, I want to continue working on this document on my PC," and you hit the little button and it went to your PC. You know, well, actually, in that case, it would open in Word. Never mind. <laughs> if you were browsing <laughs> the web, I should say on Safari yeah. or Chrome or whatever, um, that would open in Edge. You can't make yeah. it open in your default browser. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Hmm. I'm surprised, frankly. I thought with all the marketing push that Edge would have done better by now. I think they probably yeah. are surprised. Yeah. I yep. do. Well, the numbers were horrific before, but now they've been halved. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, like half of horrific. Yeah, okay. So it's even worse than we thought. It's really yeah. twice as horrific. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. By the way, here's <laughs> yeah. the good news. Just in uh, Dunkin' Donuts is coming to Petaluma. Uh, nice. <laughs> this just in from Patrick Delahanty, who has never really lost his allegiance to the East Coast. So expect a much better show next week. Speaking of things <laughs> that are half, um, perfectly good latte uh, for half the price of a Starbucks latte. Is it perfectly good? Yeah, it is. I actually prefer it, to be honest. All right. Okay. I welcome your review. I look forward to it. <laughs> I never understood the appeal. <laughs> you know, I feel like Dunkin' Donuts is different in different cities. Oh, maybe it like, is. I maybe we won't get the real. It's good in Boston, yeah. but Rhode yeah. Island. You know why? It's so it's good. like uh, Guinness. It, it relies on the water. 
Yeah, no. so, I think that's you know, it. Where you are, it's not going to be the same. <laughs> Is that really? So that's interesting. No, that's not, that's in New not York, not that great to me compared. Actually, New York has the best water in the country. That's where it's it should be. Very good. Very good tap water. No, we have good yeah. water, but I'm just mean Dunkin' Donuts here versus Boston. Oh, I see. I so I've never that. had it in Boston. I've only had it in Rhode Island. I'm going to have to uh, give it a second chance. Mm. I'm like, uh, you know, I don't leave the house much, but the thing that's interesting here is that there's a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> right down the street. Those guys all know me already. Surprising. I'm, 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 I'm greeted like Norm when I walk in the door there. It's your cheers. <laughs> it's, it's really strange. Uh, Cortana... Da -da 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 now works with Google Calendar. Actually, people were buying Cortana just because it worked with Microsoft's calendar. Uh, yeah. Now so this comes up because, you know, the Invoke speaker just came out, and all of a sudden people are like, hey, um, how come I can't get my calendar on this thing? <laughs> and, I don't know. Uh, so this week, Microsoft added Google Calendar support to Cortana on the PC. So if you go into connected services on uh, Windows 10, you will see Google as an option, and that's great. So you can add that stuff in. Um, I don't think it's been added to the mobile apps. I, there was some interesting language on iOS. It said something like preparing it for a future <laughs> calendar update or something. So I think it's coming. And my invoke is not plugged in right now, so I'm not 100% sure. But I'm, I, what do you think? Does that require? I feel like mm -hmm. if you connect it on any of the endpoints, it should just be there. Um, so I don't know if anyone's tried it on invoke. I have not, but... It, if it doesn't work today, I think this means it is it is coming. Yeah, I haven't tried it because I don't use Google Calendar. <laughs> yeah, I, how I can you live don't without use. Google Calendar? I don't. Nobody I know uses it. <laughs> I use it. What? <laughs> you know no, me. I, mean, I use I, it. What do you mean nobody? My guys, you know? I live in the Microsoft Everybody world. Everybody you know uses it. <laughs> no, I think I it's don't. the best one. I I love Google you do. Calendar. Yeah. You do, yeah. Especially on mobile, the app is incredible. Yeah, all my all my calendar stuff is in Outlook. So, yeah. Yeah, so old school, Mary Jo. I am. I'm old school. <laughs> About some things, I'm very old school. Notepad. <laughs> um, Windows 10 whiteboard app now in public preview. Yeah, finally, it's working. I guess I haven't tried this one either. Have you, Paul, tried this? But um, it's a collaborative whiteboard app that lets people running Windows 10 work together, even if you're not in the same room, right? So um, you can have collaboration across multiple Windows 10 devices. You can use pen. You can use, um, I guess you can even do things like add local or web photos that you can turn into stacks. You can, you can do all this stuff collaboratively in this app across your Windows 10 devices. And um, ultimately, this and this app is going to replace the whiteboarding app that's in the Surface Hub Conferencing Center. So this is going to become, it looks like, the Microsoft default whiteboarding app. Yeah. So there, there this is where it, this is where it came from, right? It was the Surface Hub. Yeah. Was the yeah that the was where they this. started it, right? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, I saw people playing with it. It looked kind of fun. Um, I would use it because you know that yeah. all the hardware stuff is real expensive. So. Yeah. Yep. Get a big screen, yep. put it on your Surface Studio. And, yep. Yeah. Yep. It's English only for now. Support for other languages coming in the coming months, their favorite phrase. Um, <laughs> and yep. to use this, you have to have Office 365 personal work or a school account. So you ha you can't use it unless you also have Office 365. Okay. That's how they get you. That's how yep. they pull you in. <laughs> And uh, speaking of uh, pulling you in, educational gains, this was something Microsoft is very worried about with the mm -hmm. Chromebook starting to eat its lunch in schools. Yeah. Well, they should still be worried because <laughs> the, uh, I, I, I believe their headline was something along the line of strong growth. And by strong growth, they meant 4.3%. Um, I I don't know. I, I, I think the long-term story here is not positive for Microsoft that what well, the trends we've seen over the past three, four years, whatever is Chromebook on a rapid expansion and windows kind of coasting and falling. Um, that didn't happen in the most recent quarter, but the report that Microsoft sites looks at the past year and it did happen every other single other, other quarter. So the interesting little side note here is that in the quarters in which any of these companies announced something, they actually all saw a spike in education. So Apple announced a new iPad pro, 
a little spike that month, uh, that quarter. Uh, Microsoft announced their, their education stuff in Windows 10S. They got, they got a little spike. And so uh, we'll see next year. You know, we'll see what happens. Um, but the the long-term trends, which, again, you know, the, the report they cite says this, <laughs> is that Chromebook is kind of running away with it. And um, yeah. <laughs> I think the big loser here might ultimately be Apple, not Microsoft. Yep. But I, I see Microsoft as kind of the the B player in this space mm -hmm. going forward. And that's bad news for the future because, you know, those kids coming out of school, like I keep saying, will have expectations and those expectations are going to be Chromebooks. They're going to be Google services. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, yeah. I, I get a lot of pushback on that uh, notion, but Mary Jo and actually Leo, of course, will appreciate the fact that a lot of the trends that we've seen in IT and the enterprise over the past uh, many years actually now have been driven by users. Um, you know, mm -hmm. BYOD and, um, you know, the, the lessening of these super strict policies uh, for the companies that are providing devices uh, were driven by demands of users. You know, that's yeah. how this happens. I mean, the mob rules ultimately. And, um, you know, it's a long term. That's a big problem for Microsoft, because mm -hmm. if you're not in the Microsoft sphere as a kid, um, you might, you know, it's like the app, we were making fun of the Apple, like, what's a computer? You know, what, what's Microsoft? <laughs> you know? Yep. I mean, they, they may know it from, doesn't Minecraft, don't they make Minecraft? You know, why would I want to use their word processing software? Yeah. So, yeah, you, you're right that the, if you look at these numbers, these are from, from future source and what they're measuring are shipments, not install base, right? So in, in Q3, Microsoft's gains in, in the education space, meaning K through 12 mobile devices, came at Apple's mm -hmm. expense, it, not at right. Chromebook's expense, right? right. Um, right. But the, the interesting part here to look at too is the worldwide trends, not just US. So those are US numbers we're talking about so far. In the world, right. in the rest of the world, Windows is the by far dominant player in education, um, yeah, including over Chromebooks, right? <laughs> that's right. But Chromebooks are very um, uh, US centric at the moment, but there are markets are. in Western Europe, uh, Australia, and New Zealand yep. where the that Chromebook thing is happening. You know, yep. so they're behind the United States in the sense that, you know, Chromebook hit big in yep. education here. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, whatever, yeah. you know, for, for obvious okay. reasons. I mean, uh, the cost mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of simplicity slash efficiency, whatever. Yeah. Um, not being or not having to have people who are technical to manage the devices mm -hmm. is kind of a huge deal. Yeah. And it's something sure. I still don't feel like Microsoft quite gets, to be honest. But um, I think closer. this is going to happen everywhere. Yeah. They did Intune yeah. for yeah. education this year. So they, they realize they have. They have, their Achilles heel is deploying and managing these devices in schools. So they're trying to figure right. that out, make it easier. Um, well, but I mean, the re well, so the re by the way, the reason future source, uh, future sources numbers are super interesting is they mm -hmm. note in their research paper here, Chromebooks initially were deployed in 2014, 2015 in many of these schools, and okay. they're going to be up for replacement in 2018. So the question is, what are schools going to replace them with? More ah, Chromebooks? That's interesting. Or no? So, <laughs> I, well, I mean, there are always going to be dissenters to this, but yeah. um, the one thing I think Chromebook deniers have a little bit of trouble with is the fact that people who use these things actually really like them. Love them. them. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, they yeah. Do. the one thing no, you, they do. you don't see in education with Chromebook that you do see with, say, like iPads is everyone got really excited for a little while about iPads in education. And then one semester or one year went by and all the schools were like, we're not doing that. This is crazy. Yeah. And they all started backpedaling on that. And now they have to, you know, now the decision is, well, you know, maybe PC, mm -hmm. Mac, Chromebook, whatever way they go. But the the iPad and education thing did not pan out at all. Um, Chromebook mm -hmm. did. Um, it's not just a case of like, hey, we bought a bunch of cheap crap. Let's do so do it right this time. It's like, hey, this this really works. And I told you this story, but my daughter not understanding what PowerPoint was, which was my own <laughs> little initial stab of fear about the future. I said, what are you talking about? And she, she never heard of it. And, and really? Said, wow. It's a presentation That's thing. And she astounding. says, oh, it's, it's like it's Google, Google Sheets. Yeah, she, no, a, she said Google Slides. And I'm like, oh, oh God. Oh. A whole generation grew up with PowerPoint. Oh, God, the future. Cool. Yes. Wow. Yep. <laughs> not good. Yep. If you think you were worried, what do you think Adela was feeling? <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah sure <laughs> and there was a little happy dance in larry page's office that day <laughs> exactly <laughs> he, was, 
I'm sure he was on skates or something. He said, send her another yes. dog. Bring another dog in for that girl. <laughs> we enough, hear enough. the Labradoodles working. <laughs> right. right. Team me up, Scotty. This sounds like a Mary Jo Foley title. It is. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of Teams news for folks here. So one is, um, if you are somebody who's been watching Microsoft's progress and bringing Skype for Business features over to Teams, you are going to be happy this week to hear that some of the telephony uh, capabilities that they promised are actually showing up. There are some people worried, you know, Microsoft said at Ignite, um, by the end of this year, there would be things for people who have been using Skype for Business um, around advanced telephony, things like external calling, um, what else? Caller ID masking, extension dialing, all these kinds of advanced phone features uh, that previously have been available through Office 365 E5 or Skype for Business online. But they are starting to show up as supported in Teams. So it does look like Microsoft's making good on its roadmap commitments to get these features supported in Teams. As you know, they need to do this in order to get people off of Skype for Business Online and onto Teams, which is their ultimate goal. They're not pushing you off, but they're encouraging you by dangling these little carrots over there so that you'll be able to do things that you only could do in Skype for Business now in Teams. So that's the good news. The bad news for Teams is if you've been waiting for the other shoe to drop in terms of guest access for Teams, you're going to have to be waiting until 2018 for full guest access. So Microsoft uh, announced a couple months ago in a big way, hey, here comes guest access for Teams. And guest access is a very much needed feature for Teams. People who want to add somebody who's not in their organization to a team were not able to do that. You can now, if the person has an Azure Active Directory connection with your team. But what people really wanted was to be able to add somebody to their team who had a Microsoft account, an MSA. That capability was supposed to happen um, sometime before the end of this year. And now, based on some tweets from somebody who works on the team's team, it looks like not until sometime in 2018 is this going to show up. So sorry if you're waiting for that, but the good news is, you're getting some phone capabilities. Little, little good, little bad. A little coal in the stocking, a little candy in the stocking. Teams for teens. Teams for teens. Teams for teens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. And then there is some good news on the horizon. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's, there's hope. There's hope for Surface Phone. We what? Should, can we no, even stop, say that? Stop. No, I, I, I know. I just, I, I know. If Don't God, call I it swear, a surface I, phone. Listen, mark my words. If Microsoft calls this thing Surface Phone, I'm retiring. I give up. They're not going to do it. They're not. I can't. I can't. No. I can't even. Anyway, but we've known for some time that Microsoft is working on some mobile something something, and there's been rumors of a dual screen device and all kinds of stuff, and. This past week, uh, new patents emerged for Microsoft for a foldable mobile device of some kind, um, also potentially with dual screens. And so I don't remember how this came up earlier today, but at some point we were talking about mobile in the future and why. And, you know, they're, they're obviously going to keep trying here. Um, you know, one of the things I left out of the Snapdragon conversation was where's Microsoft, right? Where's the Surface Snapdragon device? Um, it's kind of interesting that they haven't announced anything. I, I don't know anything about this. Uh, CES is coming. Microsoft doesn't typically have an official presence at CES. Um, yeah. So sometime in the spring, I would imagine they're going to announce something. Will that something be a Surface Pro with that chipset, a Surface laptop? Or will it be something completely different, like this curious, curvable yeah. Foldable thing. phone thing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, foldable. Yes, foldable. That we Comfortable. think is called Andromeda. That's that's the thing right. we keep talking about is Andromeda, yeah. right? And some yeah. people even call it Courier 2.0 because it, it's this thing that looks like a book, right? And you keep seeing Microsoft do these patents where it it all is, no pun intended, hinging on the hinge, right? <laughs> it's it's about the hinge. It's about how you, you connect can't, this thing together. You can't together. buy writing like that, folks. It's just you can't. <laughs> I, if, that was my, if, if I were writing this, my headline would yep. be it hinges mm -hmm. on the hinge. Hinging on the hinge. Yep. 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 Yeah, so, I mean, 
the the interesting thing too is who's patenting this, who's who's applying for these patents at Microsoft. There, are pe- I think one of them at least is somebody who has worked on Nokia cameras in the past. Um, there's somebody else who worked on the Hinge for the Surface Studio, who patented some of these things. So it it looks kind of real. I just I agree with you though. If they call this Surface Phone, they're setting up false <laughs> expectations, right? They've got Apple right where they want them. <sighs> no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I know. Yeah, and the other good news or interesting future news, we should say, is Microsoft did release this week its promised uh, preview of its quantum development kit. So um, this is the thing they talked about at Ignite. They said there were going to be some tools coming for quantum computing uh, for people who wanted to start dabbling in this and so Mary, Mary they jo, have Mary. released a kit that has Mary the jo. q sharp Mary jo, yes Mary jo. yes what they call what they call the q language. sharp man yes what? i know and you q know what sharp. do you remember this q sharp so q you know sharp. microsoft has c sharp right um F they've sharp. done a lot of languages with the sharp symbol um what do you call that symbol hash hash hash, hash. hash or pound <laughs> no no uh right Remember, remember, I, I met with those guys at that at Ignite, and I yeah, I have no idea what they're talking about. I have no idea. You can read my yeah. notes; it's nonsense words. And yeah. um, <laughs> I, I wrote a joke article where it was like, um, "Everything you need to know about Microsoft's quantum computing initiative." Dot 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 is the article I would love to write, but I have no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. But <laughs> then I realized I, I actually have to write this article. But um, I told those guys, I said, I said, so this Q sharp programming language, blah, blah. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I said, Q sharp. And they said, I they look at me so like we don't we don't have a name for it yet. I said, You said Q sharp, didn't you? And uh I maybe they didn't, I don't know, but it's obviously Q sharp is the name. Yeah. And they were like, That's a great idea. And I'm like, oh, I, <laughs> am I so Paul, are you it? taking I credit? I, heard it. I think you're taking credit. Or you're subconscious. No, 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 no. no. I, I thought no, I heard we were- them say it, but yeah, you, so here's what happened. Here, It's like one of those things. Remember we heard this? We, you and I were sitting on the stage at Ignite with Seth Juarez. We were doing the pre-show yeah, thing. Right. And right. then somebody tweeted, they're, they're going to talk about Q Sharp. And I said to you, are they going to call that thing Q Sharp? And you're like, wow, that's a great idea. That's <laughs> a great name. That's the obvious name. It, it has to be called Q Sharp. Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> okay, yeah, they, that's where. they did. They called it Q Sharp. It's the programming mm-hmm. language for quantum computing. There's a Q Sharp program, programming language, a compiler, and then there's a simulator because the quantum computers for this don't, don't exist yet, right? Um, so if you want to start playing around with it as a developer, there's this free preview. You can download it. You can get a feel for how this is going to work. What When one day there are quantum computers or at least simulators on the cloud, like on Azure for quantum computing, and uh, anything you build using this kit, they say will work on real quantum computing um, services I, and or thinking devices. this far ahead is so weird. It's like it's I'm so going to build there, a, right. a car because someday the yeah. land masses will be connected and I can drive. There. Yeah, right. You know, like I, it's just, <laughs> it's just seems so impossibly in the future. I know. Yep. Yep. Q shot. Yeah. So it's there. Quantum. Your quantum SDK is ready, ready for use. If you if you feel like you are ready for it, it's because just, yeah, I don't understand computing. who's. <laughs> It's like I, I wrote a fart app on iOS. Should I be looking at the quantum computing dev kit? Or? Faster, You're the faster. perfect person. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We made it for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. I know. How do I, I, I like just comp- explaining what is a quantum computing device? I'm like, okay. So the Cubits. idea is there's going to be a new kind of way of processing that's not binary, that's in parallel, and it's going to solve all the world's problems. And there you I go. I just think of it as there. There are bits. That will blow your mind. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. I, yeah, I don't know if anybody understands it really. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't. I just, and I don't even I know, know if it's working yet, is it? Is it safe I to mean, say it's working? It's I think the way they can tell it's working is the computer implodes. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like, uh, it's very I, strange. I, IBM has said they're putting quantum processors in systems at, at some point in the near term, I believe. So... I don't even know how that what that looks like because of the whole idea that quantum computing requires like some crazy negative temperature to operate in, right? I don't know. They're going to re-enter the PC happy. business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all I know is that qubits are are more than qubits. more than 2 bits. 
<laughs> yes. They're <laughs> somehow multidimensional, <laughs> but I've already explained how ignorant I am on this topic. Yeah. I guess I should read up on it. I actually have. I've read it many times, and I still don't understand it. Seth Juarez was not just all over this topic. He was actually I very know. knowledgeable about it, and he I wanted was. to strangle him because he's so smart. I and I, <laughs> I just... You know, it's like I'm over there like, I like eggs. You know, and he's talking about <laughs> quantum computing like a genius. For a long time, you know? I kind of ignored it. I, I put it in the category of uh, yeah. fusion power, that it was yeah. theoretically possible, yep. scientifically yeah. ch very challenging. And, you know, I mean, we were still at the level yeah. even a year ago where, you know, they were doing two plus two. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. If, you know, I understand the theory, I guess, but I don't know if the practice is, is close. Let's take a break. Let's talk about uh, something a little more practical, and then we'll get to the back of the book. But first, a word from our sponsor, Captera. Now I know a lot of you listen to this show, and one of the reasons I think people like this show is because we cover enterprise uh, technologies from Microsoft and so forth. So a lot of business people listen to this show, and, and maybe people who work in an enterprise where they are tasked with finding the software to run the enterprise. Now, it's easy enough to say, well, I'm going to use SharePoint and Exchange or whatever Microsoft services. But what if you're a dog groomer or a yoga studio or then a bakery? How about a donut bakery? Oh, what if you're – where do you get the software to run your bakery? Well, you could Google bakery software. You'd kind of be hit and miss. You'd also find a lot of sites that are kind of bogus, you know, paid sites by the bakery software maker. Or you go to Captera. Captera does it so well. They are over 500 categories of business software, thousands of programs. Look at 45 bakery products. You can sort it by product rating. You could sort it by the number of users it supports, how it's deployed, web or locally, you know, on, dis on disk, what features it has, or... Uh, in fact, let's do that. Let's say let's let's say I only want to see five star or four star and up. I want to see it. It can handle. Uh, they're going to be two to nine users as a small bakery. I don't care if it's web or or hard drive, but I do have to have inventory management, a labor cost calculator, nutritional labels. Am I going to find something? Yes. As a matter of fact, there are two products: Flexi Bake and Sci Bake that will both do. Look how easy this is. I'm going to make a comparison chart. And then I can com literally compare all of the features, how many users it supports, starting price, whether there's a free version or a free trial, features it includes, screenshots, and reviews from real users just like you. Based on these reviews, I think FlexiBake is definitely the way to go on this one. I'm all in on the FlexiBake. See, this is an awesome product. Captera. Did I mention this is free? I just did all this without signing up, without creating an account. There's no charge. 500 categories of business software, thousands of programs, hundreds of thousands of real reviews from users like you. As the new year approaches and the challenge to get your business in line gets closer and closer, maybe you ought to visit captera.com slash windows and find out what's out there to make your life easier. Captera. C A P T E R R A. Appointment reminder software, architecture software, assisted living software, auto repair, big data, blogging. It just goes on and on. Captera.com slash Windows. Try it right now. And it's free. It's free. Did I mention it's free? No charge. All right, Paul and Mary Jo. Time for the best part of my day. <laughs> I love this. Oh, you the back of the you book. Have, you need to have better days. I like the free stuff, the fun stuff, <laughs> the cool stuff. So this was a better tip about two hours ago. Uh -oh. And if you're listening to this on <laughs> Thursday or Friday, whatever. Oh, no. Is it over? About it. Well, it's not over, but Microsoft is in the middle of a twelve days of deals that they do for Christmas every year. Is this day thirteen? Today's still what's that? Is it day thirteen? Yeah, it's day thirteen. <laughs> no, today's deal is uh is is one of the better ones. The problem is half of them are now sold out. Oh, so uh, today's deal is $200 off Windows Mixed Reality headsets. Oh. Um, these headsets typically sell for about $400, $450, somewhere oh, in that price so it's range. Like half off. Um, 
originally, um, I was going to recommend getting the Acer version, which is the thing that I have, the blue one you see there. Um, however, the Lenovo one is still available as I as I am speaking. <laughs> so if you're watching this live, you might want to rush and have any interest in Windows Mixed Reality and, and wanted to experience it for a lot less money. Uh, that one is a good choice or for $250, uh, the HP version. And I think the those three headsets are roughly comparable. There, there is one much more expensive headset from Amazon. I think it's called the Odyssey. I believe it is on sale is like four hundred and forty nine dollars or some horrible amount of money. Um, it has slightly higher resolution than the other headsets. It's absolutely not worth the extra money. Um, so I would move quickly if you want to do that. And if it's Thursday, I apologize. Yeah. Um, and then from an App Pick Week, uh, we had, I think we talked about this earlier when it was in preview, but Star Groupie is here. Yeah, we did talk. Um, Mary Jo picked this one. Yeah. Yeah. So right, that's right, right. So um, it's generally available. So if you wanted to just buy it outright, you can do so now. I was playing with it uh, over my trip uh, to Hawaii last week, um, and it works like actually as Mahedi's uh, photo shows with uh, desktop applications, which is awesome. So you could have a notepad in there. You could have command line. You could have PowerShell. Um, whatever you want. You can mix and match. Works really, really this well. This is a great idea. Love this. Yep. It's, a, it's such a good idea. Microsoft's going to do it. So it's going to become part of Windows. Um, it's not clear if they'll get to desktop apps in the first version, uh, but they will eventually, obviously. Uh, but they are adding this to Windows. But if you don't want to wait or if you don't want to get Windows 10, this works, I believe, with Windows 7 and Windows 8.x as well. Yeah, I bought the uh -huh. whole StarDoc object desktop. Yeah, uh, yeah, Just because yeah. I love them, I wanted to support them, and I uh, can't wait to use Groupie. Yeah, I, we're running out of companies that make really good Windows utilities or whatever, and th these are one of the. This is one of the few that's been around forever and just does a consistently great job. So, uh, Brad, Brad Wardell and those guys are just they're they're great. So this um, one, this next one's the most important one to me. Yes. <laughs> so I actually haven't gotten this one yet, um, and uh, Brad tells me I might want to wait. But PUBG, uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is available on the Xbox as of, I should say, on the Xbox One as of yesterday. So why um, does Brad say don't buy it? So he doesn't have an Xbox One X. Apparently on a normal Xbox, it is really slow moving. Uh, oh. Low frame rates, uh, quality isn't great. Um, it's not super expensive. I may actually just buy it. This is and, a preview uh, release though, right? It's not wasn't supposed to come out till December 31st, I thought. Yeah, it's a preview, but that's you know you know the game. They they it's pretty much in perpetual preview, so yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it kind of stayed there. But um, it's uh, you know it's a first person shooter, so if you're not into that kind of thing, you might want to just forget it. Um, it is all the rage, and I get little pop ups on my screen for many things, but one of the many things I get them for is for Steam. And I get to see every time my son is playing this game at his expensive college that I'm paying for, <laughs> and he plays it a lot. Oh dear. <laughs> so, <laughs> He likes it quite a bit. No, I um, can't wait to play it. I think it's going to be addictive. Yeah. Yeah, let yeah. me launch my Xbox app and start the download. Yep. Yeah, $30. <laughs> so it's not horrible. I mean, a lot of uh, AAA games, obviously, are in the $60 price range. Yeah. So I, I am, I'm going to get it this week. I, I didn't buy it on day one for some reason. But I've heard since Brad, you know, ranted about it that actually if you have an Xbox One X, it does it does run much, much better. There, and I think uh, there is it server issues or is it uh, is it no it's frame game? rate frame issues. rate okay yeah it's the game the game has always been really punishing I mean even on a very high end PC it's not optimized as as we would say but it, it doesn't run particularly well but um, you know it's a massive uh, open world with lots of stuff to draw and I guess you know if you think back to, I don't know how far you have to go but like a PlayStation two type game where the 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 background is drawing as you head toward it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's got a little yeah. bit of that effect to it, which is lousy. So yeah. we'll see. I'm excited though. That's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a big deal. All right, that uh, that does it for Paul. Must be Mary Jo Foley and Enterprise Pick of the Week time. Yes. Yeah, so my Enterprise Pick of the Week is for businesses who have been using Microsoft Premier support. Um, this is a warning kind of a tip. So. Um, Earlier this year, Microsoft said they were instituting this new program for people who've been in Premier support. It's called Unified Support. And, you know, of course, when Microsoft announced it, it was painted as this excellent program. Now you can have your cloud and your on-premises products all wrapped up together in this more simplified um, support program for business customers. Well, Gartner's raining on Microsoft's parade a little here, and they're putting out a warning saying, check the check the fine print on your 
uh, Microsoft Unified support contracts because many of you may end up paying more than you were paying for support under the premium uh, under the premier program. And um, so the, uh, the guidance here is if you are someone who's been transitioned to this new unified support program, check your costs, especially how you're being uh, charged for your online products like Azure and Office 365. See how you used to pay before, what you used to pay before with Premier and how you're paying now. Microsoft's not denying that the pricing is going up for this, by the way. They're saying, yep, we realize some customers be paying more, but we think they're going to be happy with what they get in return. How much more, you ask? Gartner's warning some people could see 25% to 30% cost increases, which they said is putting them at the high end of what some companies like Oracle and other companies who've got a reputation for really gouging people on maintenance are charging for support. So word to the wise, go over those contracts. Don't just accept that, hey, it's going to be just like it was before. Fair enough. Yep. Watch and out. Unified <clears throat> support. Sounds good. Might might cost you more. Maybe you can negotiate. Who knows? And that means, I think, codename pick of the week time. Right. So we forgot to mention this, I think, when we were talking about ARM last week. But back a year ago, we knew a code name called Cobalt. And it turned out Cobalt was the code name for x86 emulation on Windows on ARM. Hmm. Why am I bringing it back up? Well, one is obviously Windows on ARM is in the news. We talked about it all, the entire show last week. But look at what Walking Cat tweeted recently. He just did this inked image that said Cobalt PC exclamation exclamation. That's it. He didn't say anything else. So Paul was hinting earlier, you know, hey, I wonder if we're going to see a Surface with an ARM processor. What if this is <laughs> That's the, that's the is worst tip that. ever. <laughs> like a yeah. walking cat. What walking are you cat, doing? He, what are you up to You know to what? Here? That guy, he knows everything. He Like he knows stuff. And sometimes he even holds back on stuff, I feel like. But I think he's hinting maybe we're going to see a Surface with x86 emulation on ARM. Huh. Just, just throwing that out there It'll as a possibility. It'll be called uh, Cobalt. Huh. At least the code name will be. That should be one of the colors. Oh, it should. Yeah, it should. Cobalt Blue. That would be good. very mm. nice. Well, I think uh, y'all have earned your beer this week, so let's get a good pick. This is a good one. Um, Firestone Walker, I think I've been picking them a lot lately, but they make a lot of good beer in Paso Robles. And no, you really don't they have me. made a blonde <laughs> barley wine. El Dorado. <laughs> El Dorado. What That's pretty yeah, good. The name is awesome. That's good. Yeah. Um, so if you know what barley wines are, they're super strong. This one clocks in 12.8%. Wow. Um, but it's so delicious. It's It's got honey in there. You can taste mm. vanilla and bourbon. It's mm. like got everything delicious in a dessert kind of a drink. Um, the problem is it's light in color and very easy to drink. So a lot of people just kind of chug it down and it's 12.8. So be, be aware. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. It's yeah, out it's now, best though. just to drink this one in bed. It is. It is. Yeah, at don't home, try to walk a fire. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't, you don't, yeah, don't go home from where you drank this. No. Yeah, and they're selling, um, Firestone Walker used to only sell these in these large format bottles, which were great for sharing, but not so great for drinking by yourself. Now they um, also are selling them in smaller size bottles. So that's a little better. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Mm. Well, I can't believe it, but here we are at the end of the show already. It uh, just whizzed okay. by a great look back at the big stories of uh, and the lesser known stories of 2017 next week a special visit from santa claus on the show yes. that should be a lot of fun <laughs> saint chris saint Cop. chris mm. yeah i like it <laughs> as we yeah, call i like it that should, that's <laughs> always a lot of fun our, his third annual appearance on the show mary joe foley writes for zdnet you'll find her blog at allaboutmicrosoft.com paul Thorat he blogs at thorat.com t h u r R O T T dot com. And his books are fine at leanpub.com. And of course, they join us each Wednesday about 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC. If you want to watch live, you can at YouTube, or sorry, twit.tv slash live. We're on YouTube, you stream Twitch, all of that. But just twit.tv slash live will give you the choice. 
You can also, uh, if you're going to watch live, be in the chat room live. Great bunch of people at irc.twit.tv. irc.twit.tv. We uh, do ask if you want to be in studio, and you can. You're welcome to visit that you email us ahead of time for security reasons. We want to kind of control who comes in here. Uh, just email tickets at twit.tv, and we will make sure to be welcoming. Otherwise, I can't guarantee you a welcome. <laughs> in fact, I can guarantee a shunning. <laughs> you might be, you might, we might look at you blankly uh, <laughs> if you show up. But do email tickets at twit.tv because we'd love to have you come visit us. Uh, now, if you can't watch live or visit, you can always listen on demand after the fact at your convenience. Just subscribe to Windows Weekly. You can find issues, uh, episodes to download at twit.tv slash WW, audio and video. And if you look in your favorite podcast app, you'll find it. Again, audio and video can be automatically subscribed to in many podcast apps. Um, and if you do that, you'll get it each week. And that will be a boon, a, a wonderful thing for you and for us. We thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Mary Jo. Enjoy decorating your gongs. <laughs> And we will see you next week on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye. <laughs>